Excellent. Thank you, Naeem. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for uh, this wonderful symposium that MIT puts together. Uh, it's really phenomenal. And uh, thank you to the panelists. So a little bit in terms of the, um, the framework here, I'll let the panelists introduce, them, introduce themselves briefly for about a minute, um, give us the highlights about themselves and what they want as a sound bite for us to remember for the rest of our lives. And then uh, we'll get into um, the actual discussion that sounds like, based on an introduction Naeem gave us, I think we should all so be talking about anti-aging, <laughs> things where none of us are going to reach the issues that he talked about. We don't get included in those numbers. So uh, let's start off with Julie and then work ourselves down the panel and then we'll get started. Thank you. I'm pleased to be here. My name is Julie Vaughn. I'm the, uh, uh, I, I, actually, up until last December, I was the Chief Information Officer for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Um, and then December, I moved over to become the Deputy Director for Operations for the, uh, the brand new Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, which, um, uh, when I talked to Todd Park, who was the Chief Technology Officer for the Department of Health and Human Services, some of you may know Todd, about whether or not I should move over and take this job, he said, the Innovation Center, oh my God, they're going to save healthcare in the United States. Um, which got me really jazzed about the mission, but I have to emphasize we are absolutely not going to do it alone. We're going to do it with many of the colleagues that you see sitting here on the panel and, and with um, other healthcare providers and, and payers in the country, And uh, but I'm very pleased to be here. My name is Frank Maddox. I am a nephrologist by training and uh, am the Chief Medical Information Officer for Fresenius Medical Care. Uh, we are a, a large provider of dialysis services uh, in the renal disease industry, dialyzing about 140,000 patients in 1,900 centers across the uh, U.S. and about 800 um, uh, centers in other parts of the world. Uh, integrating uh, a large set of uh, systems both for applications and health record keeping uh, knowledge management and uh, information exchange and uh, so I spend most of my time in those arenas. Good afternoon, I'm Joe Pleasant. I'm the Chief Information Officer at Premier uh, Healthcare. Uh, we are a large uh, alliance. We uh, do group purchasing services for over 2,500 hospitals in the United States. Um, all the way from medical, surgical, pharmaceutical, any type of purchases that they make, about $36 billion a year in purchasing. We also have a large clinical database, uh, the largest clinical database in the United States. We've been doing this for over 25 years and uh, collecting that data in a way that we can then look at the cost and quality. Uh, our background is engineering, uh, industrial engineering, and so of that background, we've been doing the analytics around that, uh, looking at paper performance, working with CMS in terms of providing them that data, and uh, working very closely now with ACOs. We have about 80 hospitals that are actually uh, looking at experimenting with ACO, and uh, we're providing the data and providing the back, uh, background to, uh, to, to that group in terms of how they do that. My name is Bill Ray. I'm the CIO at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Rhode Island. Um, I manage technology, operations, customer service, continuous improvement, and sort of meddling just about everything else since the whole world's changing. Um, I've been in the healthcare industry for two and a half years. And the first thing I learned was this is an incredibly complicated stakeholder landscape compared to financial services where I came from. The only thing everyone agrees on is that they hate the insurance company. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying through operational excellence to really change that as best I can. <coughs> Blue Cross of Rhode Island is, has about a half million lives that are insured. Um, we have about 60% market share in the state, and we're a not-for-profit. Great. So there's this uh, whole concept of cannibal care organizations, and so the first topic for the panel is to talk about, we, we hear a lot of buzz about this new framework around accountable care organizations. And what are the challenges that each of you sees um, in the near term of actually making this reality? And is it going to become reality? Uh, and let's start from the far end, Bill, from your perspective, and sort of work down this way. And then by the time we get to Julie, she'll have all the answers. <laughs> well, let's start from the carrier's perspective. Sure. What do you think is going to happen? Um, I think that what's been put in play 
is something that's necessary. And I think it's essentially saying both government and market forces are saying the, the stakeholder landscape we have now in which no one really profits or has interest in the customer, the patient, um, being more healthy um, just can't, can't happen. Now, of course, one would think the patient would be most interested in that, but frankly, a lot of times they don't have economic skin in the game. Providers, of course, do a great job, but it's not always in their economic interest to take care of patients in a more effective way. So something's going to have to change that, and I think ACOs are sort of the term that's used for new relationships between the stakeholders that lead towards that common sense win-win of if people take care, better care of themselves preventively up front, you spend less money downstream in the system. So we do think there will be, we think there's some examples of this out there already. We think there's going to be a lot of creative ways to do this. We think there's going to be a lot of abysmal failures. We think there's going to be some successes. And our job is to try to, as best we can, be an honest broker in bringing the different stakeholders together to achieve those ends. Joe, you deal with data all the time. Is it realistic that we're actually going to have every piece of information we need to hold doctors accountable? No. <laughs> uh, simple answer. I, I think it's very complex, and I think that's the key, though, for us to get standards in place that allow us to be able to transport that data from the patient even to the, all the care providers and, and payers, et cetera, as well as employers. So uh, we see that's very key, and we think that uh, certainly the High Tech Act and trying to establish standards around that clinical data is really important part of that. But it's going to be difficult. I mean, we have disparate systems now, and we have such a wide variety of definitions of clinical data, as well as even in the supply chain, we have big differences in how uh, organizations define medical devices. So uh, given all of that, we've got a long road ahead. But I do think government uh, and the regulations and the standards that they're trying to put in place will help. And I think it'll be a natural migration as these ACOs come together and hope hopefully have competitors begin to uh, collaborate and work together to uh, agree on what those standards will be. Frank, as a physician and, and from somebody on the delivery side, do you think that the provider community buys into the fact that this data is actually going to make things better, or is it going to make it worse? Uh, is, I th is the information going to be readily available? Yeah. I think there's a lot of anxiety in the provider community over a variety of aspects of this because there's some fundamental changes to how we have traditionally looked at patient care. We've looked at patient care as being a variety of one-by-one -one relationships in the uniqueness of that relationship. And for chronic disease care and the integration of team-based care, there's some fundamental uh, changes in culture that have to occur for, uh, for physicians and, and the bulk of the provider group. When I look at the information challenges here, I see sort of three areas. This change from patient-by-patient -patient care to population management is really a fundamental shift that leverages two pieces of the information infrastructure. Not only are there applications and systems that have to, in fact, make that data available in a way that's relatively intuitive for the, um, uh, for the users, but we've got to actually be able to have appropriate analytics and metrics on population analysis that frequently at the front line have not been made available previously. And then the third part is the transparency of clinical data exchange, recognizing that care occurs in multiple venues for most providers, uh, and the ability to scale these information exchange uh, relationships is going to really stress the system quite a bit. I think there are huge challenges in that particular area. And then the third area that I think has providers with a degree of anxiety is when you move from a fee-for-service payment model to a value-based purchasing model and you impute payment based on quality measures, then you have to assume that the quality measures are keeping up with the science of the medicine at that point. And so if the measure development process is not in sync with the advances in medicine, then you could get some very um, confusing um, uh, uh, incentives in place or disincentives, as the case may be. So I think those are the challenges as I see them. Yeah, um, Julie, you know, Todd and I had this conversation a couple of years ago, and one thing that we worked on before he went into HHS that mm -hmm. I, I chant this every day is that technology would only be an enabler towards payment reform. 
So based on everything that you hear day to day, what you hear, do you think it's, what, what is the government's role, short term and long term, to help facilitate the complexities of technology and data that have to happen in terms of adoption? And, and what do you see as the challenges in the evolution of that? So, I mean, if I was going to answer that question, I, I'm, I have to do it in the um, perspective of our particular agency. Because the government is going to have a whole bunch of different roles. We have roles in standards, we have roles in regulation, we have roles in oversight, we have roles in auditing. Um, as, as probably as the largest purchaser of health care in the country, uh, which we are, with the Medicare, Medicaid, and CHIP programs, um, we understand that we have a big role to play in trying to help sort of lead the way. Um, and in the Innovation Center in particular, and CMS um, more generally, we, we, are, we are striving to be a trustworthy partner. Um, because what we are all about here, all of us, and by you mean all of us, because raise your hand if you're a consumer of healthcare. <laughs> Consumers of healthcare out there? The other, thing I, other question I like to ask people is, raise your hand if you are either over 65 or aspire to be over 65 <laughs> someday, and you're a United States citizen, then you're, then you're going to be part of our program. So, um, so but the, we're, we're fundamentally changing the business model of healthcare, and so it's really not a technology problem. Okay, there are technology problems here that we do need to resolve, but the, uh, the changing this business model where really the primary absorber of risk in the healthcare system today is the insurers and the healthcare payers. And so the insurers are the bad guys, right, because they expect to get, and you know, we are relatively nonprofit, I guess, but expect to get compensated for absorbing that risk, right? So now what's happening basically is we're gonna say, we're gonna share risk. Um, and we're gonna need to figure out how to do that. And so providers are gonna have to do different things because they don't really know how to manage risk. They, it's not something that they've had to do. Um, uh, certainly insurers are gonna have to do different. We have to pay for healthcare differently than we have in the past, not uh, claim by claim by claim, but um, think of an episode of care possibly or uh, for outcomes-based measures, um, w which we're talking about. So, and I think that that's the challenge. And even for the consumers of healthcare, those of us who you know, sort of don't think it, things are gonna look different um, over time. Um, and um, I think that we all are going to have to be um, cognizant of this as we're going into this because it's a, I call this the, uh, you know, you know the beginning of Star Trek where they say space is the final frontier. I think in some ways healthcare is the final frontier of, yeah. of um, IT. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I want to come back briefly to this whole dynamic because we hear a lot about, you know, Bill wanting to control and need greater transparency in terms of why premiums are going up, doctors are kicking and screaming about, you know, oh no, my reimbursements are going to get cut. Um, so how do we keep a balance in this whole model of proposed collaboration that everybody is going to be happy? Are we going back to managed care again because all of the information is going to restrict payments? Is that where we're headed back to? Is that? I, I hope not. I mean. I, I just look at other, I, I know, yeah, I've only been in the industry two and a half years, so I haven't completely, you know, fallen prey to the idea that healthcare is completely on its own and different than everything else. Markets work. Markets work with almost everything we do, with the cars you drove here today, with the phones you use, with the incredible technology you use in your world. And at some point, we've got to stop thinking that we can manage care and that all of the stakeholders except for the customer can figure it out. Now, because it's amazing how often people in healthcare t spend time talking to each other and the patient is the afterthought. And it doesn't mean that providers and payers and, every, and the government don't want people to be happy and healthy, but we don't design things from a customer-centric viewpoint unlike all the other industries we have that do that very effectively. So no matter how much we talk about managing care, if we're not figuring out a way that it's in people's economic interest to take care of themselves and be healthy and spend less money, combined with some kind of catastrophic safety net. Imagine, for example, that if, look at, health insurance is very similar to having auto insurance where you show up at the pump and you pay, you know, $5 and then the government fills your tank. How much would you care that it costs four fifty a gallon for gas? The answer is not much because right. it's only a little bit painful. This is exactly the same corollary, and we've got to move it back to 
again, mixing markets with some kind of government safety net, I think, will probably be the end game. And we're not we're far from there at this point, although there are some promising beginnings. So when you come back to the amount of information, Frank, and, and doctors are traditionally not ones to use data to manage their practices or from the clinic. Who do you think should be footing the bill? Because there's clearly, um, you know, how do we get to that baseline of technology and information to then even start collaborating? Because it sounds to me that that tends to be an apprehension here. So how does that all come about? Yeah, you know, my, my general feeling is, is that uh, when you think about categorizing this concept of value-based purchasing, it, there's a staged approach that I see. And so uh, as we begin looking at how uh, performance risk becomes part of the revenue stream for a practice and some of the risk for a medical practice. One of the things that's a piece of that is we began through, at least in the federal programs, and remember as a nephrologist, 90% of my dialysis patients are paid for by Julie. <laughs> and so, so she is the, the dominant payer in our field. So the federal payer kinds of drives a lot of these, but the concept is is that you begin with this recognition that you've got to have technology that allows you to report on populations, and so the incentives are designed initially around certain process measures and payment for certain reporting, moving to performance-based measures and some sort of pay for performance, shared savings, bundled payment, gain share, some incentives on that front, and then on the the final front where I think we are bound to lead, which goes to what I think Bill was talking about, is if, we, if I think of pay for quality, which is what we're really looking for, is how do we improve the quality of healthcare in a more cost efficient way and a safer way for the patient, then the patient at some point has to be incented in this, in this regimen as well. So I think the providers feel that they can't alone bear the increased risk, it's going to have to be shared by a wider variety, including the patient. Yeah. And mm -hmm. part of what we're involved with here is the fact that the patients have had this situation where insurance or the federal payer has taken the responsibility for good decisions away from them. And, and ultimately, that's going to be very hard. It's politically difficult. Yeah. It, is, it is transactionally somewhat difficult. And I think for providers of care, it becomes sort of necessary flu vaccination, seasonal flu vaccination is a great example. I can, I can talk to Naeem till I'm blue in the face about him getting a flu vaccine each year, and he has veto power. And so if my payment system, if the economic model that I live under as a provider, whether it's as a corporate provider like Fresenius or an individual physician, my financial stature is based on his ability to veto my decision. How much can I influence that did, behavior? Yeah, did he veto That's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Joe, you said that it's very hard to get to, you think it, we're not well equipped. If you had, in a perfect world, three things that you could choose that need to happen in terms of technology and information, what would the top three things be? that would equip the industry to be better positioned for the effective functioning of ACO? Because you deal with this day in and day out. What are the top three things, Ben? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I, I, and this may sound simple, but I'd say certainly standardized data or consistent data that we could utilize first for analytics, because that really, as I think the folks have said here, is a basis for collaboration and so forth because without that you really don't get people to understand what their roles are within that mix of uh of you've already been successful in terms of that piece of it is there still a whole other universe that's not happening you feel because you're already sitting on a tremendous amount of data we're seeing a lot of data but what we do we have a team of probably 500 people that every day get this data in from a thousand hospitals and they spend all of their time normalizing that yep. data because all thousand hospitals data is different yep. so what we have to do is have a master we take that master and we map everything to that master just i mean it's just not sustainable and it's only a subset of the data so i think the key is getting consistent data uh, so that's one piece i i think we've got a real problem with the various information technology tools that our providers are payers and even our physician offices use 
they're all so different. They don't talk with one another. They have proprietary standards within themselves. So not only if we get the data right, I think we have an inability to talk with one another through our electronic <coughs> systems. So that's number two. But that should hopefully improve now. With I, well, I, you know, right? I, we could talk a whole. We could probably talk a day mm -hmm. about that. Right. Uh, I, I don't think what we're doing is right. Uh, I don't think it's the right approach. I think we're taking old technology and throwing millions of dollars on top of it. And I think we ought to have stepped back and look at a whole new way of doing Julie, this. Julie, is that fair? Just say So no. I'm going to say no. <laughs> <laughs> I think the third thing, just to finish the thought. I do have thought, an opinion. <laughs> I think the third thing, just to finish the thought, is um, I think education. I think data standards, I think technology and the tools that we have, and then third would be education. I think we've got a long ways to go in terms of educating employers as well as in, uh, as well as the populace about what their roles are going to be and how to interpret what they what they do there. Yeah. Quality of care and the economics. Let's talk about this because the technology only becomes an enabler. The whole idea of ACOs was to ultimately bring down costs, improve quality of care, but let's follow up on that briefly for a second. And Julie, let's start with you on this one. I know that there's work being done in terms of establishing, and there has been for a long time, what is quality of care, how performance will be measured. When is it realistically that we are going to be in a position within evolving models to consistently measure what we look at quality, even if we look at basic things like diabetes or hypertension, and we don't even get anything complex, but the more you know, day to day things. Now, is that realistic? Are we are we far from that? Are we close to that? What are your thoughts in terms of how we're? I mean, this is it's somewhat related to the to the previous answer that I gave, and that the we're we're sort of fundamentally about changing the business model and saying that we need to pay for all this stuff differently than we have for a long time. Um, you know, but I'm going to go to I think one of the things that Frank said, and there's multiple moving targets here. Right? There's the moving target of the science around healthcare is changing on a daily basis. And we, we learn new best practices and new things that we should be doing and um, all, you know, the healthcare providers, right? So that's, that's constantly moving. Then there's the, the measurements development kind of groups and there's standards bodies that are working on those issues. Um, and, and even that is hard because you can get 30 people in a room to try to talk about what's the right way to measure Am I having the flu shot conversation with Naeem to make sure he has it? What's the right way to go about doing that, right? And, and should I measure it on an individual basis or at the population level? And is yeah. 15 minutes long enough? And, and does yeah. he have to actually have to get the shot for me to be successful? I mean, those conversations happen around every single one of these. And there's how many specialties are there? <laughs> I don't even know, but there's a lot of specialties. Yeah. And, yeah. and so I was sitting on the inside of CMS and, and the Department of Health and Human Services when we were talking about the meaningful use criteria. Right? And, the meaningful, and there was agonizing long conversations about what measures we should use and they needed to be existing measures or we wanted to do new measures because we were trying to really make meaningful use happen and you know, in some ways there's probably some of us who would agree that we aren't measuring the right things around meaningful use uh, for HR but we were using measures that were defined. Then you get to the data issues. Um, the data interoperability issues and everybody has a horror story about going from one care setting to another care setting. Um, and you took a stack of papers with you, right? Yeah. And then the doctor or, or the providers in healthcare setting too are asking you a bunch of questions, right? And a lot of us are technologists and we know this should not be a hard problem, right? right? Because we've seen it in financial services. But that data interoperability is gonna be a big issue. Um, I sat in meetings when we were implementing the systems to make those EHR payments for the high tech program. And one meeting, um, this is all CMS people now, okay? Yeah. All CMS people. But you guys are all, a lot of your IT people, so you've had these kind of conversations, trust me. Where there was a 45 minute holy war, where what does provider address mean? Mm -hmm. Right? What does that mean? Is yeah. it where they provide the service? Is it where they're incorporated? Is it where their headquarters are? You know, it's it's just a, you know, is it where the payments go? Where, what does that mean? And what is the thing that we should be collecting? And so if you have that kind of conversation around address, Imagine what you start having it around quality measures and clinical data and all that kind of stuff that's sort of really sort of where we're really trying to go. So I think that there's some uh, pretty tough challenges as far as that goes. So then if we put the cart before the horse in terms of putting in place 
these accountable care organizations when we don't have the basics, or do you think that you know it's okay to move ahead? Well, there has to be some acronym of the day, and that's the one that's out there now. So, <laughs> if you have ACOs, it would be something else. Right. I think. I think. First of all, it's very big and very complex. I think we're tending to overcomplicate it, and I think we're tending to do what a lot of industries have done, and that healthcare in particular seems prone to putting the technology cart before the business horse. The issue here is a business architecture issue. It's an aligned incentives issue. So my view is Naeem ought to be perfectly free not to get his flu shot. And by the way, I don't know whether you did or not. But <laughs> if, if someone said, Naeem, guess what? I'm on the hook if you get sick with the flu. So if you choose not to get the flu shot, you're, you're on for the first 500 bucks. Knock yourself out, you know. And then that's it. And he can say, I don't want the flu shot. Or he can say, well. How many of you in the room would be okay with that? But, okay, but we'll who's supposed to pay? Again. Who's supposed to pay? We'll get to that later. Okay. <laughs> but I mean, I understand. But why would someone say so? Why is, first of all, <coughs> let's say it was me who didn't get it because I don't want to point someone else. Why should my choice to avoid something that statistically in all probability is the right thing to do, like driving with your lights on at night or wearing a seatbelt, why does that somehow impose a cost on the community when it was my choice? Because okay, what? If, if you're allergic to the, for sure, because if you're allergic, allergic to, to a flu hot. shot, oh. if you, you know, yeah. there's exceptions. All I'm saying is, I think, think there's no contraindication. We need to focus on small uh, use cases. That actually brings up a, a very important okay. question, and that is not about the flu shot, but about the fact that, that beyond what the political discussion about comparative effectiveness has been, the whole ACO model and the whole IT infrastructure of population management will demand that providers of care develop very strong ways in which we compare methods of care to try to define what is best practice, between what's best providers. evidence yes. between because providers. It's required to be a collaboration yep. between providers who may be taking care of a diabetic at multiple yep. levels. Right. Yep. Example, and, right. so, and so data answers the question that you really raise, and, and, and it is one where ultimately Patient choice is what it is, but it isn't. But the aligned incentive is, in fact, that there isn't uh, somebody's ox who gets gored uh, because of that financially in this value-based purchasing system, with the patient being able to simply do whatever they want without any consequence. Okay. Joe, who owns that data? Then? That's another complicated question, isn't it? Um, I, I always believe that the, uh, the provider or the uh, organization that uh, the patient is really relying upon has uh, responsibility for that patient's data. I think the patient owns the data, ultimately, but I think that... The clinical data. The clinical data. Yeah. And so I, 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 however, believe that when they go to that clinician or that provider that they've entrusted them to, to manage that for them, if you will. So, but, so I, my answer is that, that, that the patient owns the data, but the, uh, the provider is essentially assumed responsibility for, for protecting that data. Julie, you agree with that? Well, I mean, I think that it's, it's become sort of a motherhood and apple pie concept that patients own their data. Um, in some ways, that's a little bit um, unusual, right? Do I own my bank data, right? Because the bank created it, and sort of the financial services sector. So, you know, but nevertheless, that's definitely where we think about it. And I think this is a place where technology has to um, step up a little bit too, because if I own the data, but now, now we're going to keep it on now. <laughs> now you <get> <laughs> He's the organizer. <laughs> <laughs> about me, but Naeem is holding it for me, right? I think that that, that starts to um, change the relationship, too. And I actually think a big game changer will happen when consumers actually get more control over their data. How many people think in the audience you own your clinical data in your doctor's office? What about the rest of you? What, you don't ever go to the doctor, or what? <laughs> you don't know. Interesting, okay. But if you had access to it, like my financial data, I started getting more, quote unquote, access to it when I started using Quicken yeah. a long time ago, right? And nowadays I can go right onto the banks or the investment company's website and see what's going on with, with my data. Who technically owns the financial data? I don't know, it depends on how you define own. 
but it's created and managed um, by the financial entity essentially as an agent for the customer. So again, I think it's a matter of semantics. But I guess if you own, you log in and you see and nobody else can see, is that what you mean by all? You know, one way to look at it is the, the patient individually, I mean, you own the content of the results. They are yours and nobody else's. Um, the provider is the, has the fiduciary responsibility to maintain that. And the IT vendor, which isn't true in a lot of ambulatory systems right now, really is just a contractor to help the provider fulfill their fiduciary responsibility. But in some cases, they've made it where it's extraordinarily difficult to get access to that information. And so there is this sort of tension that has existed, I think, for years between providers having full transparent access to that information and the system controlling it and owning it because there have been financial drivers of that. I want to spend a couple of minutes on you all, the consumer. Um, because at the end of the day, information is great, technology is great, but if all the people out here don't really care about their health, then nothing is ever gonna change. And so I'll, I'll, um, I actually got a call this afternoon to do a segment on TV later, which is quite controversial. Um, should there be regulations to stop McDonald's from marketing junk food to adolescents, okay? And so everybody's going to have an opinion here, but it's a very controversial one. But it gets into Bill's point earlier about the role of the consumer. At the end of the day, consumers have to take responsibility. Um, let's start with Frank and say, from a physician's perspective, what is the consumer's responsibility here in terms of managing their health? Um, how do we deal with this? Um, in terms of changing behavior, and how do you think that you know this is going to evolve over the next you know couple of years? Yeah, the changing behavior of the population uh, is going to come in a variety of forms. There will be pressure from the marketplace and the visible pressures of society that drive that. There will be this move to creating more skin in the game for individuals and their decision making. And then in our industry, for example, because of the bundled payment system that we've moved to for the end-stage renal disease program, one of the consequences of that, which I think we will see in a lot of areas of medicine, is that we're going to be moving from having about 8% of our patients getting their treatment at home to probably 15% over the next, maybe even 20. And so this fundamental shift of more care being provided in a home-based environment um, with more of a consumer retail driven aspect to that care I think is part of what we're looking at with uh, with some of this. Julie, are, you gonna, are we going to see more people using platforms like Facebook to um, exchange healthcare information? Is that, I mean, clearly the emerging generation and a lot of people maybe in this room feel very comfortable with sharing information. Is that, is that where we're headed? So I don't know if we'll, uh, you know, be using Facebook, but I definitely think that there will be some place where I, as a healthcare consumer, can um, basically see a picture of my healthcare. And we're seeing, I think, some uh, nascent things like that that are happening now. Even even CMS, we're doing um, my Medicare .gov, right, to try to give people a picture of what's happening with them from a Medicare perspective, and trying to do things like remind them to get preventative services that are you know, paid for and they're entitled to get um, in their benefits. So I think that we're definitely going to be heading in that direction. How it gets you know, to sort of the ultimate social networking, I don't really have a yeah. vision for that. You know, Bill, you mentioned this whole example of auto insurance. Now, in auto insurance, you know, each one of us here has a different driving record. I've got the best. You all probably are much worse than me. <laughs> <laughs> But so, um, That's probably true. But the idea, yeah, I was just joking. It's probably true. But, uh, I drive in Baltimore. Right. But the idea here is that nobody pays the same rate. It's totally individualized because there's data available in terms of an individual risk. Do you think that that's the way that people should be paying for health care? If you eat at McDonald's and you smoke, then 
or you're naive and you don't get the flu shot, then you're going to win. I'm sorry, naive. No, no, I, I think we have a prestigious drug that says that clinic has a office. So they made it available, so I didn't have any choice. No. <laughs> All right. So availability is the thing. So what do you think? What is the model to drive consumers? All I can say is if you look at other areas where quality is going up while costs are going down, they tend to involve a certain degree of markets. And that includes things that are fundamental to human existence like shelter and food. So I actually think the role of the payer, the insurers, is a little outmoded. It's a historical anomaly. The reason that you get your health insurance largely through your employers is because in World War II, that was how benefits were passed out. And so I, I believe my industry has to kind of re-earn its right to be part of the value chain by focusing on what it does well, like population risk management, um, care management in some cases, and other things. But the idea that you can go have demand, which is within your control, without any of the economic consequences for it, just causes an imbalance. So certainly you can't say, if you go to McDonald's, you don't get to, you know, and you're sick, you don't get seen in the ER. Yeah. But at some point, there should be some reasonable relationship between, you know, the care that you take of yourself and the quality you seek and the economic value of that, backed up by, you know, social and government programs which we do reasonably effectively in some other areas. So yeah. I just think that there's too many anomalies in the way the system is structured now, and with a combination of some, you know, liberating market forces combined with, you know, some of the things the government is doing, that we're going to see a drastically different landscape that will be pointing in the right direction. But we can't all keep denying personal responsibility here. And unfortunately, that still happens. People talk to us all the time and say, why are your premiums going up? And by the way, why don't you cover this? Yeah. The answer is we don't cover it. You cover it. So the idea about personal responsibility means you have to make, there's sort of an oxymoron here, that you have to make data more available and it has to be more transparent. So how do you get to that then? Because in the retail industry, you know, I know that there is all this talk about, you know, Groupon or Facebook or Twitter, they're sitting on tons of our data. And, right. and we, they know so much more about us. So how do you get there? I mean, how do you drive more consumer responsibility but also limit all of the data that's accessible? That's a real difficult question. You've got the privacy security issues, and at the same time, you want to make it readily available for everyone. So um, I, I think the consumer is going to demand it. I think the mobile uh, world is going to uh, ask us as providers or physicians and even insurance companies, why can't I get that information? I think we're going to start to see the younger generations and the ones that are used to that uh, demanding it. The problem we're going to have is when they get it, can they interpret it? Can they really understand what it is? Uh, when you start having a positive lab exam or, or a negative lab exam, what does that really mean to consumers? It's confusing. So. I think we've got to have a whole uh, ontology of how we interpret that for the consumer. So that's something else that's got to happen. But to answer your question, I think the consumer is going to demand it, and I think it's going to happen, and I think, uh, I think it's going to happen fairly quickly. It's going to be forced upon us. Julie, tomorrow morning you're going to get a check for a billion dollars, and you're only going to have one thing to pick where you can allocate that billion dollars towards improving the health care system. What will that be? <laughs> we've got $10 billion dollars last year. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was so, a cut. So what'd you do with it? Here on, I was gonna say like a million, and I said, "Oh, I'm gonna get a million." I forgot who I'm I, you know, I think that what 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 we would say, and um, I think our administrator actually says this best, Don Berwick, right? That we can, that we are have basically perfectly designed our health care system, and I mean the system, because I don't want to, it almost sounds like we're picking on healthcare consumers up here, and I don't think that that's the only part of it here. We've got a health care system that is perfectly designed to deliver the results that we get. Yep. And, um, and so, you know, I think what we're seeing here is sort of a groundswell is really starting to happen, as happened the last couple years, to say, these results aren't working for us as a country, mm -hmm. right? Healthcare costs too much. We're not a very healthy country, just generally. Our population isn't very healthy. We don't measure up well to other countries in terms of healthcare outcomes. And countries that spend far less per capita than we do 
on health care. And so what we have to be about is um, improving the system that we have. And accountable care organizations is one thing that's being looked at, you know, to do that. It's, uh, it's somewhat the flavor of the day. But we certainly feel like if there was um, more um, ability on a behalf of providers to really coordinate care across settings, and again, you all have that horror story of going from one setting to another setting and, and not having your care coordinated well, that we think that that's a way we can do it. Is that the only way? Absolutely not. That is not the only thing that we need to do in our healthcare system. So there's lots of other payment models that we're looking at. You know, we're looking at um, can we make sure that some known best practices are very non-controversial, right? How you do, how you put in a central line, right? There's um, checklists and things like that. So adopting checklists across healthcare settings nationwide, to sort of basically <coughs> rooting out waste and use. So we think that there's a lot of improvement and reduced costs to be gained through quality improvement, you know, across the whole system. So the president says, I've got to give my State of the Union, and I want to talk about the number one objective we have to fix in health care from a provider's perspective. And your answer is? I think from the provider's perspective, it is um, making it an acceptable conversation to be talking about three primary goals for health care, quality and how we define it, patient safety, and cost efficiency. Today, cost efficiency is beginning to be discussed, but in the past has been a very taboo topic in medicine, whatever it takes. Well, the question is we can't afford whatever it takes right now, and it, it is the whole system, not just the consumers that need to, to buy into that. I think the second thing that I would say is that the care today is defined around a model that is episodic at the time when people aren't healthy. And so we need to create the models of care that are to be much more continuous for chronic disease management and for prevention and wellness. And the incentives placed on good decisions by both providers and patients. Okay. You get to make one technology purchase tomorrow. And Julie's going to write you a check for a billion dollars. <laughs> Only a billion. Or ten. <laughs> or ten. <laughs> For the whole country. <laughs> For the whole country. You get to make one purchase from a technology standpoint. What would that be? Wow. That will improve efficiencies within the system. What would that be? I don't think being to come close to doing what we need to do, okay. to be honest with you. So I, I guess I was, gonna say, I was going to say I was going to say that some type of capture system at the point of um, the care being rendered that would serve up that information to the populace, and I don't know what that is. And you know, certainly we have the medical record systems, the EMRs, and et cetera out there, but essentially trying to get a system that when it's captured, it is able to put it in a platform to serve it up to the populace and that populous meaning providers, consumers, whoever really needs that in the community to be able to uh, coordinate care. Okay, and Bill? So tomorrow you get to write the uh, consumer guidelines for health engagement. The three rules that you're gonna set in place in order for somebody to buy health insurance are one, two, and three, what are they? Don't accept crappy work. Um, you wouldn't accept it in other areas. Why do we accept it here? From your doctor, you mean? I mean, from where any place in the system. Any don't okay. we accept <coughs> incredible mediocrity in terms of service and excellence? And often we don't even know. So I'd say just start making the same kinds of demand. The reason I don't think this is a consumer problem. It's just that consumers have a power here that no one else has. The government can only do it by fiat. Private companies are only going to do it within the limits of their of what they can do because you know people are um, are as helpful as they can be but they've got to survive as an entity the power of consumers you know can change all this so one don't accept bad stuff two understand what's going on and um, three you know spend your spend your money wisely or foolishly as you would in any other, any other area but don't assume it's someone else's money my answer to that billion dollar thing is don't spend it we already spend too much on technology here the issue is not a technology we spent too much? issue. Oh, Do you all agree with that? Do you think we spent on you technology think we spent too much? per se? Yeah, uh, in healthcare. I, absolutely. Joe, you think you don't think we spent too much? You don't think we spent enough? No, I, I think we spend 
too much because the system's very ineffective and inefficient. Now, if we continue, if we don't change the way the process works and the systems work and the data and everything else, we're probably not spending yeah. enough. Frank, what do you think? I think we, um, I think there's misalignment with the IT financial models of how IT is purchased, deployed, and maintained that isn't necessarily uh, well aligned with the goals of where we want to take the healthcare delivery system and right you already now. told me that I cut your budget, so you know it's not. <laughs> well, I mean, the IT that we have and the money we spend now is designed, it's being spent on the system that we've designed, yeah. the business that we've designed. So we need to design a new business, yeah. which is going to mean new IT. So there's going to be additional investment for right, a while. Right, it's right. Okay. Now it's time for you all to ask questions. So, um, yes, sir. Thank you. This has been a great conversation. I'm Tom Porter. Uh, <clears throat> so, with everything that we see in the Senate and everything else like that, we know one thing: change is going to happen. And as far as the you know the the, uh, the the organizations that we're talking about, we've heard a lot today about cloud being uh, an accelerator. And so, how much um, do your organizations individually do in cloud, and, and where are you going to take that? Uh, I know that from my own. I've done a lot in uh, in healthcare, and it doesn't seem like they, they seem to be a laggard in, in the healthcare industry. So I just want to know your your opinion on that. Thanks. Well, I'll start out. I, I think uh, healthcare, as well as other industries, will have to use the cloud. Uh, I think healthcare is a laggard. I think there's a lot of concerns on the security side. Um, some of them are founded, well founded. Some of them not so much so. So uh, I think as there more comfort is gained in that area, I can tell you any time we receive the data we do from our hospitals, a big issue is around where's that data go, who, who has control of it, and they're not very comfortable if we say we're putting it anywhere other than our data center right now. And so there's a real education that we have to overcome to get to a cloud. They're not comfortable with it in your data center? Or? They're comfortable with it being under our control because they've got one throat to choke, so to speak. But uh, if I farm it out somewhere else, they're not so com com comfortable with that. I, I think in 10 years, 95% of computing assets will be in the cloud, including in healthcare. Yeah. They'll be drag kicking and screaming there. But, what, you know, if, if healthcare had its own way, they'd be generating their own electricity because, you know. <laughs> <laughs> From the bridge the business. So there's just the, the financial, this financial and technological reasons, the business reasons for going to the cloud are so amazingly compelling that even healthcare won't be able to avoid it. And let me pose a question to you. What's the real risk around information? The risk of information is a catastrophic loss, right, that leads to potential serious liability. If you're in a court and you've got a plaintiff's attorney saying, so what did you do, Mr. CIO, to protect my data? Do I want to say, well, I had my information security team you know, the, the guy from Cranston, or I had a rock solid agreement with some of the best security engineers, engineers in the world who worked for Google. Which one of those is the reasonable man defense um, in that case? So I think the cloud's coming and we just need to stop trying to get in the way. I think one aspect to the cloud that provides a good opportunity is if you, if you look at the cloud as a way to break down the components of these many applications that support clinical care initiatives, you have the opportunity to look at some of the things like medication management and reconciliation, transition of care management in a way that becomes less application specific and more standardized. And the cloud offers, uh, I think, greater opportunities to utilize tools that multiple applications will then have, have access through those in some web services type of format. I guess, you know, the answer to that question depends on, you know, sort of who's the custodian, right? So, um, I mean, I agree with, I think the cloud potentially in healthcare provides the, the benefits around data standardization that, um, you know, won't happen if I buy my own set of software and put it on my own stuff and, and, and install it. Um, at CMS, we've been doing infrastructure as a service for years. Um, and uh, we, are, we have, a, have our own data center too, but it's um, small compared to uh, what we put, when we have Medicare fee for service claims processing yeah. happening yeah. on infrastructure, and we do um, administrative things and some sort of standard like CRM type things in cloud solutions. And of course, we have a CIO for the federal government now who says cloud first. 
Yeah. So. Yeah, hi, thank you. Uh, Kurt Welcher, I got a, this is a question that I'm really curious to talk about markets and models. And I'm trying to think of another industry or another ecosystem where you have a mix of for-profit and non-profit that work efficient. And I can't think of any example when you have a mix of non-profit and profit in the ecosystem. And so is that a contributing factor to healthcare being so expensive? Because the non-profits, I don't know how they ever get efficient. Well, I, I think you can look at education, and I think you have a lot of the same issues, rising costs, not necessarily rising quality, but I think some of the changes that are happening in education are a precursor to the healthy kinds of changes that can happen in healthcare as well. You know, and again, what's tended to work there has tended to be freedom of choice, focus on quality, set people free to solve problems, and then take those models and expand them to the rest of the issue. Certainly it's an issue. Um, I'm not sure. I do believe a not-for-profit can learn to operate effectively, but it takes a different approach and a different set of incentives to do it. And my answer to that is I think there's some of that there, but uh, you'll see most of these not-for-profits, particularly the, uh, the larger ones, run just like a for-profit and have yeah. boards that are essentially every bit as uh, demanding in some respects for efficiency. I think the one thing that's expected of them that may not always be the case in the for-profit is some, uh, some community uh, charity kinds of uh, things that they get involved with sometimes for, for mission purposes, but most of them are ran pretty much like a for-profit in some respects, in my opinion. Um, I guess a tacit assumption that was, I was making as I was listening to the enjoyable dialogue was that much of the discussion around data was around structured data. Structured data mostly captured in some sort of provider system and moving that around. Thinking into the future where there's going to be inherently three, at least three new data sets, some sort of consumer-generated data, be it structured or semi-structured, continued need to get into the textual notes that are generated of care, and then ultimately, while structured, the incredibly complex genomic data that's going to be generated as the, that science evolves. Is that just, given the complexities of the current state, is that just going to get ignored in the future? Is it going to be leapfrogged into it? Is that going to be a catalyst for solving some of the problems we articulated today, or something else? I go first again. Yeah, go My view of that is that really we're going we're gonna to perpetually be in a hybrid data model. There, there is no way to um, necessarily consolidate all of those, all of those potential areas. And so we, we're going to have to have a model that supports continuously the evolution of, of uh, being able to capture the story that the patient has that is unique to that individual, the structured data, and then ultimately that data that ultimately that leads to the genomic data or behavioral data even on that on that um, that particular patient. So I don't think I don't think we have a time in the future where we aren't going to be dealing with multiple fundamentally different data types that are still important in this particular industry. Um, certainly from a clinical and provider standpoint, I don't ever see that, that leaving our world. So we've got to recognize that up front and then design the mechanisms around them to determine what's the degree of portability of which components of those data sets that actually make sense. How many of you in the room have a place where you actually save your claims data from your insurance carrier? How many of you actually have access to your electronic medical records? It's amazing. Issue, remember, again, the issue isn't a data problem, it's a stimulus response problem. Yeah. So if you had a post-it note in Naeem's card that said, get your flu shot, that's data. And then if there was a way you know he got his flu shot. Again, we tend, I'm not saying there aren't extremely complex issues associated with all this, but the fundamental issue is data is meaningless unless it changes the behaviors that lead to the outcomes that we're trying to seek. We spend all the time getting excited about whether it's hierarchical or unstructured or something else, yeah. and we forget, is this going to make the guy get his flu shot? We have one more. I have a lot of 
Hi, my name is Marina Bagor. I um, teach a course for entrepreneurship in the medical technology field. And uh, all of the students who are also uh, either budding entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs already are very excited about all the innovation that's going to happen. And what we heard today was about data and EMRs, that there's just so much more that's going on. Um, the problem that they're having, of course, is um, they're trying to fund their innovation. And all the investors, of course, are saying, prove to me that this will actually be successful within an ACO or within any kind of a model, and we will happily fund it. So what's the time frame before some of these very innovative ideas that are not just on the IT front can actually get to be put on your purchasing list? <laughs> or, you know what I'm saying? I mean, how much, what kind of time frame are we looking from actual innovation and we're sitting at the heart of it? So, I mean, I'll start answering that question, I think, because um, so much of how the United States economy works, let alone healthcare, is based on how, does, how do things get paid for? How, show me the money, right? What's the business model and how do, how do people get paid? So, um, accountable care organizations are, are, you know, they're some that exist and have been nascent, but the, um, the real start of it is happening probably in, in 2012, right? January 1st, 2012 is when the law says that we're supposed to start the shared, Medicare Shared Savings Program on the Medicare side. But we're a big payer, but still just one payer, right? And so the other payers and, and, and sort of how the whole business model starts to work, that has to all come together, I think, before some of the things that you're talking about are going to become really reality. But it's really, to me, it's a function of how we pay for and how we move money around the healthcare system. There's a lot of innovation going on now. I mean, there's mm -hmm. a lot of ways to do this. I'm seeing a lot of private equity and a lot of VC interest in this field. So, I mean, there's, obviously, they're always going to say, show me how I'm going to get my money back. But I would think now versus five or 10 years ago that there ought to be a pretty frothy market in terms of trying to find some, some money. Yeah, I would agree with that. I'm sure it's hard for them to find their path there, but uh, ACOs and I know our organization are looking for new ways to uh, have that data and collect that data and house that data and uh, interpret that data. So we're looking at all types of organizations that are uh, coming up with innovative ways to do that outside the box of what we have today. So now's a good time. It's probably real complex to in interject yourself into it, but it's, it, it, there's a lot, a lot of things going on there. So may I send some of these buddy entrepreneurs your way? Sure. sure. <laughs> well, I knew that was good. Here, prior to the whole high tech and, and um, uh, ACA Act and so forth, um, CMS has done some opportunities through demonstration projects to try to look at how these care coordination models in our area of end-stage renal disease in 2005 uh, through 2008, there was a clear demonstration of taking very specific interventions in a chronic disease management world and looking at whether you could change the quality cost curve with regard to that. That being the case, then there's an opportunity through existing legislation, either through the ACO rule or through the Innovation Center where Julie is, to try to look at models of care for these chronic disease populations that are in the pilot form. And the pilot form is then, if it works well in a larger scaled population, can more easily be put into the payment system where demonstration is more sort of a science project. Uh, of the whole thing. And so I think for entrepreneurs that are interested in this, the, the other area that is clear, and it goes back to the question asked previously on the various data types, is when we start getting a substantial volume of patient level generated data from the patient with personal health records and other things, there's an entire industry that will develop, I think, around the clearinghouse function of of making sure that data is in the place that it needs to be. And so I believe there are actual components to our IT infrastructure that don't actually exist today that'll be necessary to actually deliver it uh, if you look five and ten years down the road. All right. Thank you very much. That concludes our session. But